Welcome to this video. I'm uh, Mr. John from explainingmaths.com. Uh, so many of you have asked me to do another paper four as preparation for your IGCSE maths exam, and uh, then especially a paper four from 2016. So uh, that's what we're about to do. Um, so before we start, we're just going to have a look. We have two and a half hours. Make sure you have all the equipment. Make sure you have a proper uh, calculator, and to remind ourselves. We write in black or blue uh, pen, a yeah, pencil for diagrams, and we round everything to three significant figures if the final answer, and only the final answer, is not exact. Okay? So uh, let's get started. Question one. So it's not a surprise, it's a question about uh, yeah, ratio, percentages. Most of the times, that is what question one will be about. Uh, be about. So Christian and Stephanie share the money in the ratio 3 to 2. Yeah, so Christian will receive more than Stephanie. He receives $72. Work out how much Stephanie receives. So a very nice question to start with. So Christian gets three units, if you like. Uh, there are several ways of solving this. Uh, what do I do? I say, well, the 72. Divide that by 3. And then in your calculator, if you want, it's going to say 24. And then you can do 24 times 2, because Stephanie has two of those boxes, which is going to be 48. So she's going to get $48. And then they continue by saying that Christian spends 45% of his $72 on a computer game. Calculate the price of a computer game. And that is for one point, so that's an indication. It's a straightforward percentage question. You can do 72 uh, divided by 100 to find 1% times 45. And I just grab my calculator. Uh, 72 divided by 100 equals times 45. $32.4. And I'm just going to put a zero there, 40 cents. Although you don't have to. 32.4. Then question I, I, I. It says Christian also buys a meal for $8.40. Okay, so after the game, uh, he uh, is a bit hungry. Calculate the fraction of the $72, or his total money, Christian has left after buying the game and the meal. Give your answer in its lowest term. Okay, so um, how much money will he have left? Well, he had uh, $72. Uh, take away the $32 dollars and 40 cents for the computer game and then take away all eight dollars and 40 cents for the meal so that is the amount of money he will have left uh, let's equal that let's uh, work it out so 72 my calculator now minus 32.4 minus 8.4 so the amount of money he has left 31 dollars and 20 cents but they want that as a fraction of the total amount of money so 31.2 out of 72 and in my calculator 31.2 divided by um, 72 equals and then as a fraction uh, because that's in, their, in its lowest terms you're going to get 13 out of 30 there you go but then back to Stephanie let's see if I can scroll up yes I can Stephanie buys a book in a sale for $19.20 this sale price is after a reduction of 20%. Calculate the original price of the book. Now, this is for three points. So that's an indication that we are talking about reverse percentages. And please check my website, explainingmath.com, where I explain that in more detail. Now, what you do, you need to realize that that price of $19.20, that is 80% of the original price, eh? because this is the sale price after a 20% discount. So divide that by 80 to get 1%, times it by 100 to get the original price. So 19.2, sorry, my calculator, 19.2 divided by 80, and then times that by 100, $24. So do not take 20% of the $19.20. That's a normal percentage question, no. It's a reverse percentage, so this is 80% of the total, divided by 80, times it by 100. I do now, before I continue, I'd like to apologize for my handwriting. It doesn't look very nice. Uh, that is because I'm working with this special pen on an iPad, and uh, I just can't write uh, things down uh, properly. So uh, my apologies, but I will do my best. Let's go to the next page. 
So Boris invests $550 at a rate of 2% simple interest. Calculate the amount of money Boris has after 10 years. Okay, so simple interest, um, okay, 550 So you have to be able to distinguish between simple and compound interest. This is simple, it's in the name. Find 1% times it by 2. So that's the amount of interest he receives. Excuse me. So that is in your calculator, if you like. Uh, I should be able to do this. That's $11, of course. But okay, $11, that is in one year. For 10 years, so that's the $11 for 10 years times it by 10. So he receives $110 interest. But the question is, how much money does Boris have in total? So 550 had the money he invests initially, plus 110, so $660. Marlene invests $550 at a rate of 1.9 per year. Compound interest calculates how much money she has. Several ways to write down those workings. Um, I don't like to use the, these formulae. Some of you like to use those, but uh, usually uh, those students who use the formula mess it up. She starts with 550, so write that down. And after one year, that will have be increased. You multiply that by 1.019. Yeah? So after one year, this means that that previous value, $550, is going to be 101.9% as large. And that for 10 years, so to the power 10, and that's going to be your answer. And if you plug it in your calculator, uh, and let's write down all the decimals, you're going to get 660 3.9028 and a few more decimals. So with money, we usually round that to two decimal places, 663 and 90 cents. There we go. Then Hans, nice name. Hans invested $550 at a rate of X percent per year compound interest. And at the end of the 10 years, he has a total amount of $638.30. To the nearest cent. Find the value of x. Now, that, now that's quite a difficult question, but rather than uh, to focus on the things you don't know, or rather telling yourself, oh, I've never done this before, let's write the things down that we do know, because um, what do we usually do? We do, uh, yeah, 550, what I've, I've just done, times, yeah, let's, let, let's call it a, yeah, to the power 10, and that apparently equals 638.30. So I want to find out what A is going to be, because then I'll find out X, uh, the, the percentage. So A to the power 10 equals 638 and 30 cents over 550. So A is going to be the 10th root of 638.3 over 550. Hang on a minute. So that's how I can find A. So 66, six, no, not 66, six, six, three, eight point three divided by 550 equals, I'm putting this in my calculator now, and then the 10th root of the answer equals, and then I'm getting 1.015 and a few more zeros, 405 as an answer, which means that... Um, the new amount is going to be 101.5% of the original amount, which means that person gets 1.5% interest. So X equals 1.5. Um, unusual question again, but rather than to tell yourself, I've never done this before, uh, I can't do it, let's write down the things that you do know about compound interest, and then you will notice you get actually quite far. Okay, to the next question. So we've arrived now at question two, which is clearly a question about transformations. Um, see two triangles there, and what do they want from us? They say, draw the image of triangle T after a translation by a vector of five, two, five minus two, excuse me. So a translation meaning um, you pick up the triangle and you just place it somewhere else. So the size doesn't change, it's not being rotated or anything else, just in a different position. And five minus two means five units in the horizontal direction and two units down, yeah, so vertically. Okay, so um, 
you need to draw this so that's accurate. So it's not a sketch, but on my iPad that's going to be a little bit difficult. So I'll show you how to do it. Um, you take a vertex, uh, so one point of the triangle, for instance, that one over here, and you move it five, so one, two, three, four, five, and then two down. So that's at point four minus four. And you put a little point there, four minus four, there we go. Now I could do the same thing for all uh, other two vertices as well, or because the shape doesn't change, now with my ruler and sharp pencil, but I'm gonna sketch it, but you need to do it with a ruler and a sharp pencil, you accurately draw that triangle. Now, mine is gonna look absolutely miserable, but uh, I'll try my best, there we go. So that is gonna be the triangle. Again, you have to do that more accurately. Now what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna put there T apostrophe, which means the image after the transformation. Uh, let me just check that to be sure. I'll take this vertex, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, so that is correct. So don't mess up the horizontal and vertical distance uh, uh, the translation and be aware of that negative, so that's two units down. Okay, moving on, draw the image of triangle T um, after a reflection in the line Y equals one, okay? So Y equals one, that is the mirror line. So we're gonna draw the mirror line and make sure that you're able to draw that. Y equals one, that is a horizontal line. So you do that again with a ruler and a sharp pencil. I am just sketching it because I'm on my iPad. And then the reflection, I'm going to draw now and I'm gonna take this vertex first and I'm gonna go to my mirror line, one, two, three steps. So another one, two, three steps up. So it's going to be uh, over here. And I do that for all vertices and um, over there, so sorry. So the other one is gonna be one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four. And the last one, one, two, three. So one, two, three over there. And then with my ruler, sharp pencil, I make a beautiful drawing. And now I'm just sketching. I wanna be very clear about that. This is not what you should be doing, but on iPads, this is the best I can do. I'm sure you can do better. I'll do T double apostrophe just to distinguish uh, between the two images. All right, describe fully the single transformation that maps T onto Q. Okay, now um, you have different types of transformations and go to my website explainingmaps.com where I explain all of them in a lot of detail. And this one you should clearly say, well that is an enlargement, right? Because it became bigger. So you're gonna write down enlargement. Enlargement in better handwriting than what I'm doing now. But we have to give all the information. And for an enlargement, you have to give two extra things. The skill factor and the center of enlargement. Now the skill factor, let's start with that. And this is for three points, by the way. So that's one point for saying enlargement. Another point for the skill factor. Now, how many times is Q bigger? Well, for instance, this length is one and is one, two, three there, so that's a scale factor of three. Yeah, Q is three times as large. But just to check that, this horizontal line is one, two, so that this one has to be six, yeah, two times the scale factor, two times three, so one, two, three, four, five, and it is six, so fantastic. Scale factor is three. Finally, now we have to find the center of the uh, enlargement, so let's put a C there and we give that as a coordinate. And what do we do to find the center of the enlargement? We are going to find or identify corresponding points. So this point is the same as that point in that triangle. And we're gonna connect the two with a line. And we're gonna do that for all three points. So find the corresponding one in the other triangle and connect them with a line. And where those three lines meet, so their point of intersection is gonna be the center. Okay, now, again, on my iPad, that is going to look absolutely miserable, okay? So I'm gonna try the best as I can and connect those points with a line, but you should do a lot better than this, yeah? This is just the technology, I'm sure. Perhaps you wanna give me, leave me a comment to show me how I could do a better job than just this, because this is, of course, not acceptable. But as you can see, they will meet probably here, but you have to do that with more accuracy, but it will probably meet there. So that is the point of, uh, or the center of enlargement, minus six, minus five. All right, so I'm gonna write there, minus six, minus five. There we go. 
Um, that was for three points. Fantastic. Let's move on and see what happens now. So we're still on question three, however, uh, 3B now, and I see matrices of order two by two. Work out M plus P. So you, uh, for one point, this means not too much work. Uh, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it's not a lot of work involved. There's no method marker either, so the answer makes it correct or wrong. So you just add the corresponding points, so M plus P. So you do one plus one, so that would be a two here. There we go. Uh, what is that? 2 plus 3, so a 5 over there. There we go. And then, uh, sorry, I was distracted there. A 3 plus 0, so 3 and 4 plus 6 will equal to 10. So 3, there we go, and 10. Then they asked to work out P times M. Now, there are several ways of doing that. Uh, make sure you're able to uh, do that in a calculator as well, because the calculator can calculate that for you. Um, but, oh, how do I uh, work it out? I write down 1306, so that is matrix P, and then across a matrix M over here, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it's a 2 by 2, multiplied by 2 by 2, so the answer is also going to be of order of 2 by 2, so I put the dots there. And then I go horizontally and vertically, so 1 times 1 plus... 3 times 3, so that is going to give me 10, so a 10 over there, and for this point I'm going to do 1 times 2, so that's 2 plus 3 times 4, 12 plus 2 is 14, I hope you can read my handwriting, because I can't, 14, there we go, uh, 0 times 1 plus 6 times 3 over here, so 18, and check my website, I have videos that will explain this to you in more detail, how to multiply one matrix by another. So the answer is going to be 10, 14, 18, 24, like that. Okay. Um, then they continue with question III, where for three points, so that doesn't mean it's difficult, but there's working involved, they ask M equals N with those vertical lines and then find the value of K because you have this unknown K there in matrix N. Now, with regards to matrices, what do those vertical lines mean? That means the determinant. What is the determinant? Oh no, actually they say that the determinant of M is the same as the determinant of N. And what is the determinant? As you can remember, we only have to do that for a two by two matrix. So A, B, C, D. The determinant is A times D. So AD minus B times C. That is going to give you the determinant. So for M, that would be 1 times 4. 1 times 4 minus 2 times 3. 2 times 3. Now, if we work that out, that's going to give me, what is that, minus 2. There we go. And that has to be the same as the, de the determinant, sorry, I uh, can hardly pronounce that, of matrix N. So 4 times K... 4k minus 1 times 3 has to equal minus 2, yeah, because the value needs to equal the determinant of m. Uh, if we rearrange that, this is minus 3, so to the other side, minus 2 plus 3 becomes 1, so 4k equals 1, so k is 1 over 4, or 0 0.25 if you prefer. Okay, um, moving on, describe single the sorry, fully the single transformation represented by that particular matrix, 0, minus 1, 1, 0. Um, and please, you should do the same if you're sitting this exam. Those bold words are important. When you are reading that mentally, you should be saying, describe fully the single transformation. Uh, so those bold words, you have to give it a little bit more emphasis because it's important. All right. Now, there's several ways teachers teach this. I know teachers, they want you to remember those matrices. Um, I do it uh, differently. I have a look at two points always when it comes to matrices and transformations. I'll have a look at this point, which I call 1, 0, which is uh, uh, the vector, the unit vector, if you like, uh, 1 horizontally, 0 up and down. And then I'm going to have a look at this point, uh, which is point zero one, 1, huh? so, which is the vertical unit vector, zero to the left or right, and one up. Okay. Now, in this particular case, that 
x unit vector is the same as that first column of the uh, of this matrix and that column is zero one now how can I go from one zero to zero one then I will have to travel into oh that's not what I was trying to do sorry then I'll have to travel into this direction come on like that agree and what kind of a transformation is that that would be a rotation a rotation and that would be 90 degrees anti-clockwise anti-clockwise around clockwise and the center of rotation would be the origin now just to check that would mean if that is a transformation that this point zero one after that transformation is going to be over here which is uh, point minus one zero so that then has to be the second column in the vector or sorry in the matrix and indeed it is minus one zero so describe fully the single transformation and you have a look at those columns and you ask yourself how can I get point one zero to zero one and how can I get point zero one to minus one zero and that is a rotation anti-clockwise 90 degrees around the center or around the origin Excellent. Find a matrix which represents a reflection in the line y equals x. Now you're going to do a similar thing. Let me see if I can move this a bit. There we go. You're going to do a similar thing again. That is what I do. Other teachers tell you perhaps to remember those matrices, do what your teacher tells you. But what do I do? I look at those two points. First, I'm going to look at point one, zero, and then I'm going to look at point zero one and in this case what happens with those two points after that transformation which is a reflection in line y equals x okay so first of all this point that point is going to go to the mirror line and then one up and check my website explaining maps.com where I explain that in more detail uh, a reflection with a diagonal uh, mirror line but it's going to be over there meaning that that first column it's going to be zero, 1, because the point one zero after the transformation is going to be at zero, 1. And then I'm going to do the same for that point, which you can barely read it, and that is the iPad. It's horrible, I have to say, zero, 1. After the reflection, so it will go to the mirror line, and then in that direction, it will be at one zero. So back in red at one uh, zero so that is the answer so this first column is always of that point where is it after the transformation and the second um, column is always this point uh, where that one will be after the transformation all right um, I think that was it for transformations let's move on to the next page which is about cumulative frequency I'll see you there so we're still solving paper uh, 41 out of 2016 together. I'm Mr. John from explainingmaps.com. And question three is about cumulative frequency. And you always get a figure roughly like this. And it says 200 students estimate the volume V meter uh, cube of a classroom. The cumulative frequency diagram shows their results. Okay, so before we have a look at all the questions, let's see what that diagram is about. So cumulative frequency always vertically and the volume horizontally. So, somebody, I believe, says um, 100 meter cube, and then the large value is 500 meter cube, as you can see. Okay. Uh, and you always get yeah, similar questions about community frequency. So, they're going to start with find uh, the median. And the median is that value in the middle. And for community and the median, we sometimes also call the second quartile, so Q2. Uh, so, in the middle, if I have 200 pieces of data, then uh, yeah, what is in the middle? Huh? That is going to be 100, and that's where my median is going to lie. So you with a, with a ruler and a sharp pencil, but as you know, I can't do that on an iPad. Um, you have to draw that horizontal line, but you've got to do it better than I am. Draw that horizontal line to your graph in the middle, and then um, go down to see what the actual median is. So my graph there, I'm going down, and I already can say, well, the median is going to be 400. And then we're moving on to the lower quartile. And the lower quartile we also uh, sometimes refer to as Q1. Uh, and that will uh, take place 
uh, where you divide the total amount of data by four. So uh, 200 pieces of data times a quarter or divided by four. So that is 50. So the lower quartile is not 50, no. At number 50, so I look at the cumulative frequency at 50 pieces of data. Again, with my ruler, I draw exactly that horizontal line, and you've got to do a much better job than I am doing right now. Then I'm going down with my ruler, and I say 350. And then the interquartile range. Now, what is the interquartile range? That is the upper quartile, and we sometimes say Q3, take away the lower quartile. Now, I know the lower quartile is 350, but I need to find the upper quartile, and the upper quartile is going to be 200, the amount of data, times 3 over 4, so that is 150. So that is piece, or data piece 150. So again, with my ruler and a sharp pencil, I draw this horizontal line, and I'm going down. And you really have to be accurate, because they don't give you a range of possible answers. Only, in this case, what is that going to be? 420 will be accepted. So the interquartile range is going to be 420, the upper quartile. Take away the lower quartile, 350. Uh, the answer to that is 70. There you go. But these were all one-point questions, so the answer is correct. You don't get any uh, method marks. Um, but then they say the number of students, yeah, so um, find the number of students who estimate that the volume is greater than 300 meter cube. Okay, that's an interesting question. So, how many students estimate the volume to be larger than 300 meter cube? Well, let's find out. Let's go to 300 meter cube. So, that's here. And I now go to my graph in that direction. And then, oh, like this. I think I should be exactly in the middle there if I would do that with a ruler. Uh, and that says 30. Okay. Now, don't say 30 students think. Um, the volume is larger than 300 meter cube. No, because this side is larger than 300 meter cube. It's actually that 30 students think it's less, because it's cumulative frequency, 30 students think it's less than 300 meter cube. If you ask 200 students, that will mean that 200 take away 30 who think it's less than 300, so 170 students think the volume is more than 300 meter cube. Okay, moving on to the next question. Still, uh, that's a paper four, so these questions are bigger, so it's uh, we're still talking about those 200 students. Um, also estimate <clears throat> the total area, a meter squared, of the windows in the classroom. And the results are shown below. So, again, before you dive into those questions, let's have a look what's going on. So, the area between 20 and 60 is 32, between 60 and 100, 64. So, different widths of the class, um, so that is important, that will be in relation to this, uh, this histogram, of course. And um, these are, it's a group frequency table, so indeed for four points, as expected, calculate an estimate of the mean. And why an estimate? Because we don't know the exact data, because it's a group frequency table. So the best thing we can do is take the mid values of each group and multiply that by the frequency, and then all of that divided by... 200 because we've asked 200 students okay and if i look at the several areas i would expect that my answer is let's say roughly 100 meters square okay so it can't be more than 250 can't be less than 20 my final answer so let's work it out i take the mid values and if you're not sure how to do that you can uh, just plus the two and then divide by two now yeah? plus the two divide by two so 20 plus 60 divided by 2, the mid value, I'm going to write down the mid value first, is 40, because that is already uh, generating points there. Between 60 and 100, so that will be 80, the mid value, this will be 125, lies exactly in the middle, um, and this will be 200. So the estimate of the mean is going to be 40 times 32, yeah, times the frequency, plus the mid value times the frequency, plus the mid value times the frequency. So you get four points for it, not because it's difficult, but because there is some work involved and you get points for that work. So make sure you do it. And all of that divided by 
200. So don't make that silly mistake. Don't be that student who says divide it by 4. No, you've asked 200 people. If you do divide it by 4, your answer would just not make any sense. Eh? So then you know, oh, silly me. So I'm taking my calculator now. 40 times 32 equals plus 80 times 64 equals plus 125 times 80 equals plus 200 times 24 equals. This is a times, by the way. Um, it's my pen on this iPad. I don't like the, uh, the modern stuff too much, to be honest. Divide by 200 equals 106. There we go, an estimate of the mean. Beautiful. Uh, does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. I said I, I predicted roughly 100. I get 106. Can't go wrong there then, can I? Complete the histogram to show the information in the table. Okay, I'm going a little bit back now because the histogram, as you can see, has frequency density. And uh, the density, which means, well, they do the first one for you. Eh? So if, if you're not sure how to do it, so that's... Um, that last group from 150 to 250 has 24 people. And that frequency density means that the area of that bar equals the frequency. So 100 times, yeah, times what? Equals 24. So if you like for that last group, let's write it down. 100, which is the width, or the width times question mark, the height, should equal 24, which is the frequency. Yeah? So that would be 24 divided by uh, 100, 0 0.24. If you look at the scale, these are blocks of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is 1. So each block is 0 0.2 and it's going to be a little bit more than that, 0 0.24. Just as a reminder. And you've got to do the same for the rest. And this again for 4 points, a lot of points, doesn't mean it's difficult. Uh, but we just have some work to do. So we're going to do it for the rest of the three. So let's start with the first one from 20 to 60. So uh, it will start um, here. Let me try to make that up for you. And it will finish there. But now the question is, how high should it be? So it is 20 wide times, I'll just say H of the height. That should equal... 32, so the height equals, and take my calculator, 32 divided by 20 equals uh, 1.6, 1.6. So then I go exactly to 1.6, uh, 2, 4, that's going to be there. And you have to do this a lot better than I am on my iPad. I'm going to try the best I can, but you do this with a ruler and a sharp pencil. But this is how you would then draw that bar. And I'm absolutely not happy with the results, but I hope you get the idea of how to um, how to get the height um, of that bar. That's the most important for now. We get for the next one as well. So that has a width of 40 from 60 to 100. So let me just already put that up there from 60 to 100. So let me write that here. 40 times that height should equal the frequency of 64. So 64 divided by 14 equals uh, again 1.6 okay so that has an equal height there we go and please go to my website explainingmaths.com where I do this in a lot more detail and I explain it a lot better than what I'm doing now um, but now we're just solving the past paper and then the third one a width of 50 so I'm going to squeeze it in here 50 times the height needs to equal the frequency so 80 divided by 50, and again, I believe that is 1.6. So again, 1.6, bit unusual, but nothing wrong with that. We can be unusual. All three heights are the same. Good. Um, let's move on. That's uh, one more question, I believe. Oh, that's not what I was trying to do. Where was that? That was here. Okay. Um, I wanted to read the last question. It says, two of the 200 students are chosen at random. Find the probability that they both estimate the area to be greater than 100 meters squared. And that is for two points, so there's going to be some working involved. Um, now, I don't necessarily have to look at this histogram. I can look at the table here. What is the chance you get somebody who thinks the area is greater than 100? Uh, so we're looking at these two groups. So there are 80, 104 people who think the area is greater than 100 meters squared. So for that first student you pick, you have 104 
out of, uh, what was it, 200 students? I believe, uh, yeah, 200 students. So the first student, 104 out of 200. But the next one also needs to think it's greater than 100. Eh? So the first one greater than 100 meters squared and the second one. So times, and now this is an example of without replacement because I already have this one stu student standing next to me who think it's larger than 100 and, uh, meters squared. So I now have 103 students left out of 199. Again, because this is without replacement. So 104 divided by 200 equals times 103 divided by 199 equals, and then you get 1339 out of 4975. Okay, there we go. That's two points in the pockets. Let's move on to the next question. Having a quick look, clearly a question about spheres, about cylinders. So we're going to probably calculate um, volumes, um, service area, all those things. And you can expect those questions on your exam as well. So no surprises here. Calculate the volume. It says of a metal sphere, the radius is 15 centimeters, and show that it rounds to 14,140. Correct to four significant figures. Now, I love those show that questions. This is the answer, so you can't use it in your workings. Um, but you know that once you are done with your workings, you know what you should get. And why do they do show that questions? Because you're going to need that value later on. Okay, so that allows you, even if you can't do this, to still continue. Now, for two points, they give you the formula to find the volume of a sphere. So, it's a substitution question, ladies and gentlemen. The volume, so this is going to give me one point. So, it's 4 over 3 times pi times the radius squared. And they say the radius is 15. They don't give the diameter. They're not trying to be sneaky. Equals. So, there we go. So, that's one point just by putting there 15 cubed. So, in my calculator, 4 divided by 3 equals times pi equals times 15 to the power of 3, uh, 4,500 pi, yes, that's great, but I'm going to write that now, all the decimals, 14137.16694, <clears throat> and indeed, to four significant figures, so 1, 2, 3, 4, and the 3 goes to a 4, because the next one is a 7, so that is 14140, uh, and you could put there, then shown. Okay, there we go. Um, question B. The sphere is placed inside an empty cylindrical tank of radius 25 centimeters and the height is 60. Okay, so we have this empty tank and this sphere we're placing it inside. Then the tank is filled with water. Okay, so around that uh, sphere we're going to uh, add some water. Calculate the volume of water required to fill the tank. So we're going to find then the volume of the cylinder... Uh, because that is the amount of water that will fit inside. But then we're going to subtract it by the volume of the sphere because that is already uh, taking up some of the capacity yeah, of the cylinder. So for three points, let's get uh, some work in. The volume of a cylinder, a cylinder, uh, it behaves like a prism. So we can find the cross-sectional area times the height for the volume. So the volume of the cylinder, so V cylinder, is pi r squared cross-sectional area times the height and that would be pi times 25 squared times 60 equals I'm going to take my calculator and I'm going to say pi times 25 squared times 60 and that would be I'm just going to write it down here 1178097200 Four, five. Now I don't want to be rounding too much yet, I only round my final answer. So uh, that is the, the volume of the total cylinder, but we're going to subtract it, like I said, with, by the volume of the sphere. So I'm just going to put that here, 1178097245, and then we can take their rounded value, 14140, and subtract the whole thing. So I still have that big number, the volume of the cylinder in my calculator screen, minus 14,140 equals, and again, I don't want to be lazy, I write down all the decimals, don't round straight away. Yeah, you'll get higher marks if you, round, if you write down all the decimals first. 
Now this is a, not an exact answer, of course, that is because of pi, so we have to round to three significant figures, and the three goes to a four because of that six. So to three significant figures, now on the answer line, 104,000. There you go, can you read that? 104,000, fantastic. Um, moving on to the next part of this question, can I just scroll that? Yes, I can. The sphere then is removed from the tank, okay? so. Yeah, the water was all the way up to the top, but now we take the sphere out, and of course the level of the water will drop a little bit. Calculate the depth D of the water tank. Okay, so we know that the total volume of water that we put in the tank equals to 103,669,000. Okay, and um, that now, 103. Six six nine. So I like to use the unrounded answer two seven two four five. That is the volume of the new cylinder. Yeah? So basically, you can disregard that top part and just look at that new volume. The radius is still the same. So pi times the radius twenty five squared times yeah d. What is that new height of that cylinder? So d equals and um, I still have that big number in my calculator screen, this one. I'm going to divide it by pi, first of all, divide by pi equals, and I'm going to divide it by 25 squared, divided by 25 squared equals, and then D is 50, oh, pen 52.79855713, and to three significant figures, we're going to say 52.8. I'm just going to see if that makes sense because, of course, it needs to be uh, this answer needs to be less than the original height. So I'm just going up a little bit. Ah, the original height was 60. It goes down a bit. Now it's 52.8. Fantastic. Yeah, it's not drawn to scale, but it does make sense uh, that it's still relatively close to 60. My answer. Okay, I hope that is useful. Um, let's move on to the next page. I'll see you there. We're still looking at the same sphere, uh, but it's now it's melted down and uh, the metal is made into a solid cone of height, 54 centimeter square. Yeah? So a cone, as you know, looks roughly like this, like an ice cream cone. Calculate the radius of the cone. Now, first of all, we need to realize that the volume of that sphere was given to us. It was 14,000. 140 okay so if we melt it down and we turn it into a cone now the volume will remain the same because we're still talking about the same amount of uh, metal i know in real life you're going to lose some energy there but uh, for now uh, for maths for the sake of maths the volume stays the same calculate the radius of the cone and the volume you don't even know need to know the formula is a third pi r squared h yeah because it's actually a cone is always a third of the volume of the cylinder with the same base. But okay, forget about that. The volume is the same. So um, 1 over 3 pi r squared h equals 14140. And they give us the height, right? 54. So let's write that down. That's then r, the radius. I'm going to do a few steps. In 1 now is 14140 divided by 1 over 3 times pi times that height and all of that you need to take the square root of okay that's for three points so um, don't try to do all of this in one go in your calculator do it in steps so one four one four zero divided by um, that fraction one over three yeah, or you times it by three if you like equals divided by pi equals divided by 54 equals and then we did Take the square root of that answer equals and then that radius in my calculate screen and that is an answer that makes sense 15.81297251 and don't round straight away uh, i keep saying that um, you round at the very end three significant figures 15.8 there you go 15.8 calculate the Total surface area of the cone. Ah, and there again, it is that in bold. They have the total surface area of the cone. And they say that to help you. They put it in bold to help you. Because they say the curved surface area 
and uh, yeah, with a radius r and a slant height l is pi r l. Yeah, that is the curved part around. But the total surface area also includes that circle at the bottom, so don't forget that one. Um, so if I can scroll up a little bit, uh, it's for four points, so uh, working is involved. Uh, let me see, the height is 54 and the radius, what was the radius again? Oh, 15.8, we just found it ourselves. Okay, so I'd like to draw a bit of a sketch there. Okay, so that's a horrible sketch. Again, that's the iPad guy, so I keep on apologizing, but my handwriting is horrible. 15.8 and the height, I already forgot, was it 54? Yeah, the height is 54. That's the perpendicular height, 54. Yeah, that is the perpendicular height. So that is not the slant height. And that's why you get four points, because, yeah, um, there's some working involved. Um, let's start with the base, pi r squared. So pi r squared equals pi times the radius squared. And that will be, I still have that 15.8 unrounded in my calculator. So I'm going to use the unrounded version there, squared, and then times pi. Uh, it gives me, I'm just going to write that as a fraction, 7070 over 9. Okay, well that is just that base there at the bottom. That's this one. Now the curved part, well it would be too easy if you could just plug in pi times 15.8 times 54. Now 54 is the perpendicular height, but with Pythagoras we can calculate that slant height. Let me show you. This is the triangle you'll be looking at where that is ooh, the slant height L. This is the radius 15.8 and then that height is 54. So Pythagoras will tell you that L, uh, that slant height is the square root of 54 squared plus 15.8 squared. So we just have to calculate that before you can continue. 15.8 squared plus 54 squared, and then the square root of that answer, and um, 56.26402047. So what is that curved area, pi r l? Yeah, they give you that formula for the curved area of the cone, the curved part I should say, so that would be A equals pi r l, so pi times 15.8 times that slant height, 56.264, and I'll do some dots, for those are all those decimals, I still have it in my calculator screen, so times 15.8 equals times pi equals, and it tells me 2000. 792.786407. So that is the area of that curved part added to uh, with the circle because they're asking for the total surface area. So we're going to add the two now. Um, so I'm just going to say all of this plus 70 over 9, uh, that fraction. So plus the fraction. 7070 over 9 equals, and then my answer gives me 3578.341963. And um, that is, of course, unrounded, uh, and we have to round to three significant figures. So the 7 goes to an 8 because the next one is more than a, it's a 5 or higher. So 3, 5, 8, 0. Okay, so my workings are a bit rough and it's, it doesn't look very nice and structured. Uh, again, that is because I'm doing it on an iPad or on a piece of paper. But you need, really need to structure your workings, write things down um, so everybody understands what you're doing and what you're thinking. You show all your workings in a nice, beautiful, structured, neat manner. Okay, um, and then you will do better. Let's move on to the next question. So we have arrived now at question 5 and a question about graphs and just to save some time I have already plotted uh, some of the coordinates and I'll uh, say a little bit about them in a minute. Um, what does it say? It gives me this function fx 20 divided by x plus x and x cannot be 0. Yeah? So you have an asymptote meaning um, the function doesn't exist when x is 0. That's this vertical line here. So you cannot uh, cross the y-axis 
And why is that? Because x is in the denominator and you cannot divide by zero, so uh, it doesn't exist. So complete the table. They've given you most of the coordinates. You've got to find two of them. You don't have to show any workings. It's substitution at 20 divided by 5 uh, becomes 4 plus x, so uh, that will be 9. So there we go, a 9 there. And you do the same for 8. 20 divided by 8, uh, 2.5 plus x, or plus 8, so that's going to be 10.5. Now it's quite straightforward for this one, if the function is a bit more difficult uh, and you have to find more points, please make sure that you know how to do that in your scientific calculator. It will produce this entire table for you, um, so you don't have to work out anything yourself at all. Good. And then they say on the grid, we have to draw the graph, and draw is an S, so we have to do that accurately, uh, for five points. Now most of those five points you will earn by plotting those coordinates correctly. Now, uh, you have to do a better job again than I do here, because I am on an iPad, I cannot do it properly. But you have to be very accurate and take care with the negative signs, because that's where a lot of you go wrong. Yeah, Minus 10, minus 12, so you go 12 down, okay? So be aware of that. You are also able to make that silly mistake that you all of a sudden you go 12 up. Now, the, same, the next thing I'd like to say is that you have to do it accurately, okay? So, for instance, when I have to plot uh, minus 5, so minus 5 exactly between minus 4 and minus 6, um, those are 5 blocks between them, and that is 2 units, making each unit 2 divided by 5 is so 0.4. So make sure that you plot those coordinates accurately, okay? Then I've done three on this side, and I'll do the last two, so five, nine, I'm going to plot it. And again, I can't do it very nicely, because this is a tiny screen, and um, I am on an iPad, but that is five, nine, almost, I'm not too happy with it actually, and eight, ten, point five, eight, ten, and then a little bit more, point five, a little cross there. Well, that's not even a cross, you see that? That's that pen of mine, okay. I keep on apologizing uh, for that, uh, what can I do? It also, very important, gives you a domain. Draw uh, the graph fx from minus 10 to minus 1.6. So you start here, you graph it, you stop there, and then from 1.6 to 12, and you start here, and you stop there. So do not extend the graph, okay? Do not try to approach the asymptote. And you draw a smooth curve and you stop there, and then you continue here. So also do not connect the two because you have an asymptote. Now, I'm gonna to try to do that now. It's gonna look absolutely miserable, I already know that. And okay, I'm just gonna try my best anyway. And you see that, you can't even draw anything on these things. Nothing beats a piece of paper and a pencil. But okay, um, you have to do a lot better than this, but this is just for the idea, okay? Um, and then I've already attached a page, the next page, uh, on this page, because you're going to get all sorts of questions about uh, the, your graph. So you really have to be accurate, otherwise you cannot uh, answer these questions. And they're worth loads of points, and I'm sure you will do excellent. What does it say? First of all, it says, using your graph, so I have to use my graph, solve the equation for the graph to equal 11. Now I could put it in my calculator, of course, just to see... Um, to find out what the solutions are, but equals 11 when y equals 11. So what I'm gonna do with a ruler and a sharp pencil, I'm gonna draw that horizontal line y equals 11. And I'd like to do it with a different color, red for instance, so y equals 11. Well, you could do that better than I can, okay? And it already says, it already shows I need, I'm looking for two solutions. So this is one of them and that's the other. And then with my sharp pencil and ruler, I'm going to go, down now, actually that was my coffee, okay, um, so I'm gonna try now, you would do a better job than I am doing right now, there we go, and if I read that solution, each block is 0.4, so that would be 8 point, I would say 8.6 for the second solution, 8.6, and the other one, if I would do that, would go roughly, oh yeah, just beyond the two, eh? so roughly here, that point of intersection, so 2.4, uh, for me, but you have to give the solution that you see on your axis and again make sure that you understand the skill eh? So five blocks is two units So each tiny block is 0 0.4 Okay, then they say k is a prime number and fx equals k has no solution find the possible values of k 
And so I'm probably going to make, uh, no, I'm not going to make an inequality because they tell me it's a prime number. And then what are you looking at actually? You're looking at the horizontal line for it not to have any points of intersection. So it has a point of intersection here, which is at 9. But if I go down, what is the next? I don't have anything at 8. I don't have anything at 6. But those are not prime numbers. Nothing at 4. What about 5? What about 3? What about 2? Those are all prime numbers. So I'm going to say 5, no solution. 3, no solution. Uh, 2, no solution. Oh, I forgot one. What about 7? There you go. Because 7 is also a prime number, no solution. Of course, you know what a prime number is. A prime number is a number that has exactly two factors. Moving on, the gradient of the graph at the point 2, 12 is minus 4. Write down the coordinates of the other point of the graph where the gradient is minus 4. Well, maybe you see there is a particular symmetry, 14.1, yeah? minus 14.1, 12, minus 12, 9, minus 9. So where is that other uh, point where the gradient is minus 4? So first of all, they said 2, 12, yeah? so that is there. So the other point is going to be on this side at minus 2, minus 12. It's also going to have a gradient of minus 4. And the write down part in the question means there's no working involved. Uh, the answer basically is right in front of you somewhere. You just got to uh, think logically. Okay, there's no workings, uh, no calculations. Write down. The equation fx equals x squared can be written as x to the power of 3 plus pi px squared plus q equals 0. Show that p is minus 1 and q is minus 20. Okay, that's a nice question. The the um, fx refers to this fx, so 20 over x plus x. I'm just going to write that down. Can I squeeze it in here? 20 over x plus x. And then they say when you equal that to x squared, show that you can rewrite it as x to the power of 3. Okay, so um, you need to create, or no, you don't create anything, but you need to turn it or manipulate it into a cubic function. And it's, at the moment it's squared, but if we get rid of this fraction, we multiply everything by x, right? So the entire left side and the entire right side by x. And then you'll get 20 here plus x equals x to the power of 3, and there's your cubic function. And if you start rearranging that, and you move everything to the, to the right side, then we'll get 0 equals x to the power of 3 minus x and then minus 20. Okay, so P is minus 1, Q is minus 20. And then you can say they're shown. There you go. On the grid, can I take this away? Sorry, I'm just trying to move it a bit. Yeah, there we go. On the grid, um, draw, can you still read that? On the grid, draw uh, the graph of x squared between minus 4 and 4. So that's the parabola in the origin uh, with a minimum. So uh, I'll do it in black. So we get a few points in the origin. Uh, when x is 2, y is 4. Same for minus 2, 4. Uh, from minus 4 to 4, right? So when it's 4, it's 4 squared, so 16. Minus 4 squared, also 16. There we go. I'm going to try to draw that. And it's not going to look very nice. And you have to do a lot better. But okay, that's the parabola. I hope you get the idea. Um, and then they say, using your graph, solve the equation, that cubic equation. Um, and for how many points is that? And I have to use the graph. It's for one point, yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean it's an easy question. What do you need to realize is that that cubic equation, that was the original graph, equals x squared. Okay, so, And your original graph is the blue part, and the x squared is the black part. So where are they equal to each other? Can be written like that. Well, that is at, at that point of intersection. And you have to use your graph, so then you would um, have to go down uh, from that point of intersection, go down, read it, and then you should get x equals 3. Okay. Um, right. Continue, then we have a cubic graph. The diagram shows a sketch of the graph x to the power of 3 minus x squared minus 20. P is the point n0, so that is the x-intercept where y is 0. 
several ways of solving that problem. Um, it says write down, so I don't have to show any working. It's for one point. I would say easiest is to let your calculator work it out. And if you go to mode and then to five equation, you also see that option four is a cubic equation. It will solve it for you. So press four. A is 1 equals B is minus 1 equals C is 0 and D is minus 20 because we're talking about a cubic. Then your calculator has to think a bit and then to three significant figures I'm going to write down uh, write down 3.09. Now we can also do it differently using this information from before but they don't say we have to so let's keep things simple if we can. Okay, I hope that made sense, this question. I do, again, apologize. Those graphs look absolutely miserable, but that's just the technology I'm using uh, or my, my, my lack of ability to use it properly, I guess. So please let me know if there's any way to do that better. But for now, let's go to question six. So this is a lot uh, better than uh, a graph uh, for me in this case. Uh, I'm still Mr. John from explainingmaths.com. Uh, let's find out. The perimeter of the rectangle is 80 centimeters. Okay. So this plus this plus that plus that is 80. And the area is A. Okay. Let's put a big A there in the middle. And I'll just say that the perimeter, I'll just circle that, is 80 centimeters. Show that x squared minus 40x plus A equals 0. Nice question. Um, yeah, several ways, I guess, to approach it. What will I do now? I'm going to say, well, okay, to find that area, that's going to be x times this side. And what is that side? Well, I can do something with the perimeter. I can say, well, the perimeter minus x minus x divided by 2 is going to give me one of those sides. Yeah? Because the entire thing is 80. Take away x, take away x divided equally by 2 is going to give me the length of one of those sides. Okay, if I simplify that, 80 minus 2x over 2, that's 2x, and that is 40 minus x. Okay, so that side is 40 minus x. So the area, let me write that down, by the way, 40 minus x. So the area, which is length times width, is going to be x times 40 minus x. And if I expand those brackets, let's see what happens. Minus x squared equals a. Okay, my x squared is a negative, but here it's a positive, so I'm going to move that one to the left side. x squared minus 40x plus a equals 0. Shown, because that is what they wanted me to show. Okay, now if you have problems with those types of questions, which is completely normal, Rather than focusing on the things you don't know, or rather telling yourself, oh, this is too difficult, this is uh, too complicated, let's think about the things you do know. You know what perimeter is, and you know how to calculate perimeter. You know what area is, and you know how to calculate the area uh, of a rectangle. So try to connect the two, and then see what happens, okay? Be an explorer, take a risk, and be confident. All right, then I say when the area is 300, solve by factorizing this particular equation. Okay, so the area equals 300, so x squared minus 40x plus 300 equals 0. And then I have to factorize it, and um, the multiplication is a positive, and the addition minus 40, yeah, negative, so that makes that both those numbers I'm looking for need to be both negative. What times what gives me 30 and if I add it I get 40. Well for instance minus 30 and minus 10. Okay and if I would expand that quickly x squared minus 10 minus 30x gives you minus 40 and that is going to give you 300. Great. And what are done, uh, What are then my solutions? 30 and 10 because you then use the ZPP, the zero product property that either x minus 30 has to be zero for it to equal zero or x minus 10 is zero for that to be zero. Okay, when a is 200, solve by using the quadratic formula of that particular equation, show all your working and give correct to two decimal places. Now, great question, four points. You know you're gonna get it. So, um, you know that your calculator can uh, do that for you, uh, but you have to show all the working. So you use your calculator just to check your solutions at the end. Plus 200 
equals zero. So I call it the ABC formula. Yeah? A is one, B is minus 40, and C is 200. So make sure to check my website, explainingmiles.com. I'm going to explain this in more detail to you. Now, X is minus B, so minus minus 40, plus or minus the square root of B squared. Make sure to put some brackets there. B squared minus 4A times C just fits, and all of that divided by 2a. And we have to show all our workings, so um, so don't try to be quick or be smart. We have to write it all down, x equals 40 plus or minus, and I'm going to work out that square root. So in my calculator, I'm going to do now 40 squared, so um, there we go, or minus 40 in brackets squared, minus 4 times 1 times 200 equals 800 and they want to see that number oh, 800 over there so put it down 800 and then I'm gonna say 40 plus the square root of 800 equals in my calculator divided by 2 equals and these questions always to two decimal places as they say 34.14 and my other solution is 40 minus the square root of 800 equals divided by 2 equals SD 5.86 and make sure you round correctly otherwise you lose a quarter of the points just to quickly check my solution go to your um, mode 5 and then 3 for the quadratic A is 1 equals B negative 40 equals C 200 and my calculator says 34.1 check or 1 4 and the other one my calculator says 5.86. Fantastic. So I know I'm right. I know that those four points are in the pockets. So let's move on with confidence. So we're going to continue with some algebra. It says a car completes a 200 kilometer journey with an average speed of X kilometer per hour. And the car completes the return journey of 200 kilometers with an average speed of X plus 10 kilometers per hour. So faster anyway. Show that, again to show that question, the difference between the time taken for each of the two journeys is so and so much. So for three points, some working involved, again, don't try to focus now on the things you don't know. Let's focus on the things we do know. For instance, that uh, they had to give me a distance, to give me a speed and looking for time. What do we know about speed? Well, we know that speed is distance over time, right? Uh, have kilometer per hour, meters per second. Um, what is the speed for that first part? It is x, and the distance is 200 over t. So the time taken for that first part is t equals 200 divided by x. Yeah, make sure that you're able to manipulate that as well. So that's for the first part. For the second part, the speed is x plus 10. And that equals still the distance, 200 over t. And uh, so that is, let me call this t1 and this t2 uh, for the second part of the journey. So t2 equals 200 divided by x plus 10. Okay. And now they say, show that the difference between the time taken for the two journeys is 2000 over x times x plus 10. So the so difference means that you have to subtract the two, so you take the larger value, which is t1 actually, so 200 over x, take away uh, 200 over x plus 10, and then we're trying to subtract fractions, so the denominator needs to be the same. So I'm going to multiply this one by x plus 10, and I'm going to multiply this one by x. So what are we going to get? That is going to be 200 times x plus 10 over x x plus 10 minus and it doesn't really fit on my iPad screen so I do apologize I'm gonna try it 200 x over x x plus 10 well you just have to uh, take my word it says x times x plus 10 over there we're going to expand um, those brackets we can combine the fractions now x x plus 10 and we're going to get 200x minus 200x so that one 
is gone, they cancel each other out, and we're going to get 200 times 10, which is 2000. And that's exactly what they asked us to show. Fantastic. Find the difference between the time taken for each of the two journeys when x equals 80. Give your answers in minutes and seconds. Okay. And that is always uh, yeah, a bit of a problem. So uh, with time, because I'm sure we're going to get some decimals, but uh, you just have to be careful. So 200 over 80 minus 200 over 80 plus 10. So 90 equals, or I could have, by the way, uh, substituted the 80 in here. But I didn't. But okay, I'm going to use my calculator now. So 200 divided by 80 equals minus 200 divided by 90 equals, and that is going to give me 5, oh, 5 over 18, or as a decimal, that would be 0 0.2777 reoccurring, yeah? And then some people say, oh, that's 27 minutes, but they're all wrong, because decimals are out of 10, or out of 100, out of 1,000, while time is out of 16. So you either properly convert that by multiplying it by 60 uh, to get minutes, or you use the button on your calculator, and that's what I um, suggest you do. It's this button, it has like a, a circle, and then you have some commas. There you go, just look for it. It's on your calculator screen, some commas there. It's underneath the square root sign. If you press that, it's gonna tell you zero hours, 16 minutes, and 40 seconds, okay? So your calculator does that for you. Let's move on. Nice question about vector and vector geometry. Um, I see this rectangle here and a vector R and a vector P. And that's probably a midpoint and that's somewhere in between P and Q. So what do they say? Oh, P, Q, R is a rectangle. O is the origin, okay? And M is the midpoint. Let me just put a little line there and a little line there. And P, T to T, Q is T, 2, to 1. Okay, so P, T, 2, Two, one. So you got to realize that QT is a third of that entire distance and PT is two-thirds of that entire distance, yeah? Because you have two units here, one unit there, so that's three parts. This one is two of them, that one is one of them. Okay. The vector OP is P, yeah? So a vector has magnitude and a direction, that's important. And OR is R, same thing, that one goes vertically up. Fine, in terms of P and or R, in its simplest form, the vector m q. So we go from m to q, um, and that uh, is yeah the same as vector p yeah, in that direction, but only half of it, yeah, because that is the midpoint, so it's going to be half p. So you can write that down, half p. There we go. Uh, m t, so we're starting at m again, and then we're going to t. Well, that is still half p. But now we are also going down a little bit, which is in the opposite direction of R. So we're going to say minus a third R, okay? Because, uh, like I said before, this is one out of three, and it is minus because it's in the opposite direction. So half P minus a third R. And that's all for one point, so that also suggests there's not uh, too much working involved. OT. From O to T, so um, you could do, uh, well, you could do several things actually, but I'm going to do P and then two thirds of R, so P, so that will be P plus two thirds of R. Good. Uh, but then what do they say? RQ and OT are extended, sorry, uh, RQ and OT are extended to meet at U. RQ, where's RQ, RQ, here we are, RQ, RX is extended, and OT. Ah, okay, so they're going to make them a little bit longer. So let me try to do that. It's extended, and this one is also extended. And then they meet here at that particular point. They meet at U. There we go. Find the position vector of U in terms of P and R, and give your answer, again, in its simplest form. Well, to go from O to U, first you have to go R, and then plus half P plus half P, yeah? so P, and then again, another half P there uh, to get to uh, U. So the final answer in its simplest form, so O, U, if you like, that position vector, uh, is going to be R plus one and a half 
1.5p yeah, or 1, 1 over 2 or 3 over 2p. Fantastic. On the next uh, page, and I already uh, put it here, it says mt from m to t equals 2k minus k. And they say that the magnitude of mt is the square root of 180. Find the positive value of k. Okay, so how do you usually find the uh, the magnitude of a vector is with Pythagoras, don't you? So, normally you would say 2k squared plus minus k squared equals that magnitude squared and uh, that apparently is the square root of 180 square then so I'm gonna try to put some brackets there there we go yeah um, yeah so again magnitude of a vector is that horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared equals the magnitude squared uh, and make sure to put brackets there it's 2k squared which will give you 4k squared, huh? 2 squared k squared plus k squared equals 180. So 5k squared equals 180, k squared equals 180 divided by 5. Now I should know that, but I'm a little bit tired, so I'm going to use my calculator, 36. So k is the square root of 36, so 6 or minus 6. And they're only interested in that positive value, so the answer for k equals Six. Let's move on. So we're still doing a full past paper together. Paper four. I'm Mr. John from explainingmaths.com, and please like and share if this is useful, guys. Um, I do appreciate it. They give me some functions. They give me a linear, a quadratic, and an exponential function. Very nice. And they say solve the equation when f x equals. Uh, and then we have to evaluate function g when x is 1. So let's do that first. g1, what is the value for that? So that's going to be 1 squared plus 4, and that equals 5. So they say solve the equation when fx, 2x plus 1, equals 5. That is plus 1. So 2x equals 4, then x equals 2. Uh, 4 divided by 2. Find the value, and then they have this composite function. Uh, well, you could find a composite function first and then evaluate it for 3, but it's easier to evaluate the function h for 3, and then the answer to that you're going to plug into function f, and that's going to be the same answer. So, again, h3, and try to show workings. That's what examiners want you uh, to write down. Uh, 2 to the power of 3 is 8. Don't say 6, please. It is 8, 2 times 2 times 2. And then that value into f, uh, 2 times 8, 16, plus 1, so 17. There we go. Moving on, find the inverse of f. Several ways of doing that. I'm not sure what you've learned. First, I tell my students, first write down y equals 2x plus 1 rather than fx. Then you swap x and y. And then to find the inverse, you're going to make y the subject again. So it's going to be x minus 1 equals 2y. So y equals x minus 1 over 2. So the inverse function, x minus 1 over 2. Beautiful. Find g of x in its simplest form. So the composite function, uh, g of x. So uh, what does that mean? Is that we're going to substitute the function f into g for x. Hmm, okay. So 2x plus 1 into that function. Now how many points do we get for this? We get 3 points. So there's some working involved, that's great. Um, I'm going to squeeze that here on the side, because otherwise I can't see. No, no, wait, I'm, I'm going to scroll up, and I'm going to look here at my piece of paper, what the function was again. So g, and then inside we're going to plug the function 2x plus 1 for x. So x squared becomes 2x plus 1 squared plus 4 remains plus 4. So if we expand those brackets, we're going to get 4x squared plus 2x plus 2x, so uh, plus 4x plus 1 plus 4. And I've just skipped a step there. I already simplified that term in the middle. So your final answer, 4x squared plus 4x plus 5. Okay, let's move on to the next page. Then they say solve the equation, the inverse equals 0 
Now, for one point, don't try to find the inverse of that exponential function. You need to realize um, that for a normal function, the x and a y coordinate, so if that is the normal function hx, then the inverse, uh, they swap basically, that y is going to be the same as this x value, and that x value of the normal function is going to be the same as the y value of the inverse. So if they ask you for which x value for the inverse uh, the y value is going to be 0 0.5, then you actually can do also plug in 0 0.5 as x in the normal function. Does that make sense? I'm not sure uh, it does, but this is what you do. Zero, h is 0 0.5. You're going to evaluate the normal function for a half. So you're going to get 2 to the power 0 0.5, and that is 1.41. And again, for one point, they don't want you to do all sorts of complicated things. I believe IGCC, you don't even know how to find the inverse of an exponential function, but you do need to realize the connection between those coordinates, between a function and its inverse. Yeah, They swap around. Write down the value of k, a very difficult looking um, question, 1 over hx, so 1 over 2 to the power x equals 2 to the power kx, write down, so there's actually no working involved, no there isn't, because uh, 1 over 2 to the power x is the same as 2 to the power minus x equals 2 to the power kx. So what is k? Write down minus 1. So you can just simply write down minus 1. I just use these workings uh, to make sense of the question to make sure I'm right. But uh, that's the only possible answer. Okay, I think we are ready for the last question already. Is that correct? Question 9. Let's find out. I'll see you there. So indeed the last question, and usually on a paper 4 or many times, they will make something special for you. And um, in this case it's no, no different because I haven't never seen anything like this in uh, your textbook. Um, but that doesn't mean it's, it's difficult or it doesn't mean you can't do it. You can get most of those points in because all of these questions are about things that you have learned, about things that you know, and you, you should just need to find... Basically, which chapter did I learn this? Where, where, where did I uh, yeah, read more about this? Okay, so let's find out what they say. They say the diagram shows a curve with that particularly, a particular equation. It looks funny, x squared over a squared, y squared over b squared. But they give me some coordinates there. You see that? The x-intercept is 4, the y-intercept 2, minus 2, minus 4. a is the point four zero. Uh, yep, yeah. and b is the point zero two. There we go. Find the equation of the straight line that passes through a and b. Okay, now, yeah, so that is coordinate geometry. So actually, that is something very straightforward which you have learned because you're going to find the equation of that line. And as you can already see, the gradient is got to be negative because it's going down. So let's start with that. The gradient y two minus y one. Um. So. 2 minus 0 over x2 minus x1, 0 minus 4. And I know my answer should be a negative, so anything different wouldn't make sense. You see that? Minus a half. Now, they give me the y-intercept. It's 2, so I don't have to evaluate it for any point. I can simply write down minus a half x plus 2. But otherwise, you can also find that c yeah, by substituting one of the points that you know in the equation, and you're also going to get 2. But you have also learned that 2 is the y-intercept. Considering that it is the y-intercept, you can simply write it down. There you go, three points. That is very generous. Show that a squared is 16 and b squared equals 4. Hmm, that's perhaps a little bit less straightforward. Um, they give me this equation. Now, what could I do? I could, for instance, plug in this point, the point 4, 0. If I do that, so I'm going to plug in now that point... 4, 0 in the equation. What is that going to give me? So I'm going to get x squared, so 16, eh? 4 squared over a squared plus 0 over b squared equals 1. So 0 over b squared is 0, so it says 16 over a squared equals 1. And then if I multiply both side, sides by a squared, then it says a squared equals 16 and that's exactly what they said it will equal to so great you see that was not that difficult after all and they say also b squared equals 4 well let's use that point now which is point zero 02 so um let me see can i yeah a little bit more space zero 02 so 
there we go, 0 0.02. So I'm going to get, what was it? Um, 0 squared, yes, I was confused there, over a squared plus 2 squared, so 4 over b squared equals 1. Now this part again is going to be 0, so 4 over b squared equals 1. 4 over b squared equals 1, so b squared equals 4, shown, two points, there you go. So what appeared to be very difficult and very confusing was not that difficult or confusing at all, if you give it some time and have a proper look. But I believe there's one more page, and uh, let's find out what they want from us there. So we continue with this uh, funny looking uh, yeah, circle, and uh, it's not a circle of course, yeah, but this, uh, this oval shape. They say P 2K and Q 2 minus K are points on that particular curve, and they give the function again. Let's have a look, P 2K, yeah, and Q 2 minus K. All right, find the value of K. Okay, what could I do? Well, I could, what are the options for three points? Fine, yeah, so I gotta show some workings. Well, again, let's not focus on the things that we don't know. Let's substitute this point in the equation and see what happens. Okay, so x is 2, so it's going to say 2 squared over 16 plus y squared, so k squared over 4 equals 1. Okay, so actually, uh, by substituting, I've created this equation with one unknown. So I can solve it, I can find the value of k now. 4 over 16 is a quarter, and we're going to move that quarter to the other side. So it's going to say 1 minus a quarter, so k squared, I can write that down here, k squared over 4 equals 3 quarters. Multiply both sides by 4 to get rid of that fraction, and then the square root. So I'm going to do k equals the square root of 3, and make sure that you're able to manipulate the equation like that as well. Square root of 3 equals, um, write down all the decimals, 1.73205080, so to three significant figures, 1.73. Beautiful. So uh, we were able to do that, actually. It was not that hard at all. Calculate the angle POQ from P to O to Q. Okay, let's draw that. That doesn't look very nice, does it? Okay, uh, but that's a particular triangle. And it looks as if it's right-angled over there, but it doesn't say it is. So let's not assume it's right-angled. So um, what can I do? Well, I could, let's see. Well, I could divide, for instance, I could divide that triangle, because P and Q are vertically above each other, right? So I can divide the blue triangle into two red triangles. If I find this angle and then double it, then I'll have the entire angle, right? Because those two angles will be the same. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so what do I know? I know the um, that P is 2K. So this, if I do that in blue, this will be 2, and K is 1.73, which is the Y coordinate. And then with a tangent, I can calculate that angle. And if I double it, then I'll have the entire angle. So it's going to be 2 times... The tangent, but then the inverse, of course, so minus 1, because we're looking for the angle. So I have opposite over adjacent. One. So the opposite is that height we just found, 1.73. But now it's important to take the, the unrounded values. I'm just going to use square root of 3 in my workings, rather than writing down all those decimals. Because I don't want to use 1.73, because that's going to affect my final answer. So square root of 3 over 2, yeah, 2, which is the... Um, Adjacent, okay, and um, before I write, uh, put it in my calculator, I just want to make sure that you realize this definitely is a right angle triangle, so I can use the tangent. And why is the right angle triangle? Why is this angle 90 degrees? That is because P and Q are vertically exactly on top of each other, eh? or above or below each other, yeah, uh, because they both have the same y coordinate, but just opposite sign, okay. Therefore, this is a right angle triangle, okay. <laughs> Let's plug it in our calculator, shift ton, and make sure your calculator is set to uh, degrees and not to radians or anything else uh, funny. Square root of 3 divided by 2, and then times 2 because we have two of them, uh, so we have this angle and that angle, 
and together that is going to give you 81.78678.93, so 81.8 degrees. Beautiful. The area, are we almost there? Yeah, the area enclosed by a curve with the equation x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1 is pi ab. Okay, that's already quite interesting. Eh? So pi times a times b. So we're talking about this a and that b uh, are also in the area, pi ib. Okay, find the area enclosed by the curve x squared over 16 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. And give your answers a multiple of pi. Okay, so let's let's try to manipulate this equation into that one. It's only one point, but just to show you where it comes from. So 16 is actually 4 squared, right? And 4 is actually 2 squared. Okay, so a squared, so 4 squared, b squared, 2 squared is pi times a times b. So pi times 4 times 2. So the answer is going to be... 8 pi, that's where it comes from. Uh, okay, that was one point. Two points, final question. A curve mathematically similar to the one in the diagram intersects the x-axis at 12 and the y-axis at minus 12. Okay, so we're gonna just have a quick look what that looked like again. Okay, so it's three times as far away, right? So we have this mathematically similar curve, but then, ooh, it goes here at 12 and on the other side at minus 12. So three times as far because now it intersects the x-axis at 4. Okay, let's remember that three times as far. Work out the area enclosed by this curve, giving your answer uh, as a multiple of pi. So at the moment the area is 8 pi, but for mathematically similar uh, shapes, then the area is going to be the previous area times the scale factor squared, because it's area, all right? So 8 pi times 3 squared, so times 9. In terms of pi, it's going to be 72 pi. Now, I hope that was useful. I've done this uh, very quickly, and it's not perfect. Uh, I, I, I could do it a lot better, but uh, the time is not there to do so. So I hope it's useful anyway for you. Um, good luck with your exam. Make sure to round properly, to read the question properly, to believe in yourself and to to look uh, uh, to think about all the things you've learned because all the questions are about things that you know and it's about things that you have learned in the past and those examiners who make these papers they want you to do well they want you to succeed so there's nobody out there trying to make you feel miserable or trying to tackle you with trick questions absolutely not true we all want you to do well and we know you can do it check my website explainingmaths.com um, I explain everything you need to know there in much more detail than what I've done today and with much more accuracy and patience. All right, take care, guys, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.